Chapter 1, The Alaska Interior April 27th, 1992 Greetings from Fairbanks. This is the last you shall hear from me, Wayne. Arrived here two days ago. It was very difficult to catch rides in the Yukon Territory, but I finally got here. Please return all mail I received to the sender. It might be a very long time before I return south. If this adventure proves fatal and you don't ever hear from me again, I want you to know that you're a great man. I now walk into the wild. Alex. Postcard received by Wayne Westerberg in Carthage, South Dakota. Jim Gallion had driven four miles out of Fairbanks when he spotted the hitchhiker standing in the snow beside the road, thumb raised high, shivering in the gray Alaska dawn. He didn't appear to be very old, 18, maybe 19 at most. A rifle protruded from the young man's backpack, but he looked friendly enough. A hitchhiker with a Remington semi-automatic isn't the sort of thing that gives motorists pause in the 49th state. Galleon steered his truck onto the shoulder and told the kid to climb in. The hitchhiker swung his pack into the bed of the Ford and introduced himself as Alex. Alex, Galleon responded, fishing for a last name. Just Alex, the young man replied, pointedly rejecting the bait. Five feet seven or eight with a wiry build, he claimed to be 24 years old and said he was from South Dakota. He explained that he wanted a ride as far as the edge of Denali National Park, where he intended to walk deep into the bush and, quote, live off the land for a few months. Galleon, a union electrician, was on his way to Anchorage, 240 miles beyond Denali on the George Parks Highway. He told Alex he'd drop him off wherever he wanted. Alex's backpack looked as though it weighed only 25 pounds or 30 pounds, which struck Galleon, an accomplished hunter and woodsman, as an improbably light load for a stay of several months in the backcountry, especially so early in the spring. He wasn't carrying anywhere near as much food and gear as you'd expect a guy to be carrying for that kind of trip, Galleon recalls. The sun came up. As they rolled down from the forested ridges above the Tanana River, Alex gazed across the expanse of windswept muskeg stretching to the south. Galleon wondered whether he'd picked up one of those crackpots from the lower 48 who'd come north to live out ill-considered Jack London fantasies. Alaska has long been a magnet for dreamers and misfits, people who think the unsullied enormity of the last frontier will patch all the holes in their lives. The bush is an unforgiving place, however, that cares nothing for hope or longing. Quote, People from outside, reports Galleon in a slow, sonorous drawl. They'll pick up a copy of Alaska magazine, thumb through it, get to thinking, Hey, I'm going to get on up there, live off the land, go claim me a piece of the good life. But when they get here and actually head out into the bush, well, it isn't like the magazines make it out to be. The rivers are big and fast. The mosquitoes eat you alive. Most places, there aren't a lot of animals to hunt. Living in the bush isn't no picnic. It was a two-hour drive from Fairbanks to the edge of Denali Park. The more they talked, the less Alex struck Galleon as a nutcase. He was congenial and seemed well-educated. He peppered Galleon with thoughtful questions about the kind of small game that live in the country, the kinds of berries he could eat, that kind of thing. Still, Galleon was concerned. Alex admitted that the only food in his pack was a ten-pound bag of rice. His gear seemed exceedingly minimal for the harsh conditions of the interior, which in April still lay buried under the winter snowpack. Alex's cheap leather hiking boots were neither waterproof nor well insulated. His rifle was only .22 caliber, a bore too small to rely on if he expected to kill large animals like moose and caribou. 
which he would have to eat if he hoped to remain very long in the country. He had no axe, no bug dope, no snowshoes, no compass. The only navigational aid in his possession was a tattered state road map he'd scrounged at a gas station. A hundred miles out of Fairbanks, the highway begins to climb into the foothills of the Alaska Range. As the truck lurched over a bridge across the Nanano River, Alex looked down at the swift current and remarked that he was afraid of the water. Quote, a year ago down in Mexico, he told Galleon, I was out on the ocean in a canoe and I almost drowned when a storm came up. A little later, Alex pulled out his crude map and pointed to a dashed red line that intersected the road near the coal mining town of Healy. It represented a route called the Stampede Trail. Seldom traveled, it isn't even marked on most road maps of Alaska. On Alex's map, nevertheless, the broken line meandered west from the park's highway for 40 miles or so before petering out in the middle of trackless wilderness north of Mount McKinley. This, Alex announced to Galleon, was where he intended to go. Galleon thought the hitchhiker's scheme was foolhardy and tried repeatedly to dissuade him. Quote, I said the hunting wasn't easy where he was going, that he could go for days without killing any game. When that didn't work, I tried to scare him with bear stories. I told him that a twenty-two probably wouldn't do anything to a grizzly except make him mad. Alex didn't seem too worried. I'll climb a tree, is all he said. So I explained that trees don't grow real big in that part of the state, that a bear could knock down one of them skinny little black spruce without even trying. But he wouldn't give an inch. He had an answer for everything I threw at him. Galleon offered to drive Alex all the way to Anchorage, buy him some decent gear, and then drive him back to wherever he wanted to go. No, thanks anyway, Alex replied. I'll be fine with what I've got. Galleon asked whether he had a hunting license. Hell no, Alex scoffed. How I feed myself is none of the government's business. Fuck their stupid rules. When Galleon asked whether his parents or a friend knew what he was up to, whether there was anyone who would sound the alarm if he got into trouble and was overdue, Alex answered calmly that no, nobody knew of his plans, that in fact he hadn't spoken to his family in nearly two years. I'm absolutely positive, he assured Galleon. I won't run into anything I can't deal with on my own. There was just no talking the guy out of it, Galleon remembers. He was determined, real gung-ho. The word that comes to mind is excited. He couldn't wait to head out there and get started. Three hours out of Fairbanks, Galleon turned off the highway and steered his beat-up 4x4 down a snow-packed side road. For the first few miles, the Stampede Trail was well graded and led past cabins scattered among weedy stands of spruce and aspen. Beyond the last of the log shacks, however, the road rapidly deteriorated. Washed out and overgrown with alders, it turned into a rough, unma unmaintained track. In summer, the road here would have been sketchy, but passable. Now it was made unnavigable by a foot and a half of mushy spring snow. Ten miles from the highway, worried that he'd get stuck if he drove further, Galleon stopped his rig on the crest of a low rise. The icy summits of the highest mountain range in North America gleamed on the southwestern horizon. Alex insisted on giving Galleon his watch, his comb, and what he said was all his money. 85 cents in loose change. I don't want your money, Galleon protested, and I already have a watch. If you don't take it, I'm going to throw it away, Alex cheerfully retorted. I don't want to know what time it is. I don't want to know what day it is or where I am. None of that matters. Before Alex left the pickup, Galleon reached behind the seat, pulled out an old pair of rubber work boots, and persuaded the boy to take them. They were too big for him, Galleon recalls, but I said, wear two pairs of socks and your feet ought to stay halfway warm and dry. How much do I owe you? Don't worry about it, Galleon answered. 
Then he gave the kid a slip of paper with his phone number on it, which Alex carefully tucked into a nylon wallet. If you make it out alive, give me a call, and I'll tell you how to get the boots back to me. Galleon's wife had packed him two grilled cheese and tuna sandwiches and a bag of corn chips for lunch. He persuaded the young hitchhiker to accept the food as well. Alex pulled a camera from his backpack and asked Galleon to snap a picture of him shouldering his rifle at the trailhead. Then, smiling broadly, he disappeared down the snow-covered track. The date was Tuesday, April 28, 1992. Galleon turned the truck around, made his way back to the park's highway, and continued toward Anchorage. A few miles down the road, he came to the small community of Healy, where the Alaska State Troopers maintain a post. Galleon briefly considered stopping and telling the authorities about Alex, then thought better of it. I figured he'd be okay, he explains. I thought he'd probably get hungry pretty quick and just walk out to the highway. That's what any normal person would do.